Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon and welcome to the, this is the month of July, July forum for our monthly, uh, usually first Monday, but in July and September, the first Monday is uh, almost always a holiday, always in September, so second Monday in July. Um, and we have an historical program today uh, and uh, a confession. I always underestimate how much interest there is in the history of public diplomacy. Uh, we've done uh, typically one a year, and all of them have been well attended. But I'm not certain that, uh, I think this may be the best attended of any of our historical programs. And of course, many of you have a, a, a first-hand experience with uh, the topic that we'll be discussing. Uh, I did not see John Brown yet. Um, if he is here, no, I don't see him. I guess he hasn't come yet. Um, I wanted to single him out because Today's program was his idea, and uh, uh, and he was also one of the he was the first person to say the pr that the person we should get to speak about this is the person who we have with us today. So uh, I, I say that both to credit John, but also to remind everyone that these are your programs. Uh, many of our best programs come from suggestions from others, uh, um, including those that are associated either with uh, with either of our partners, the Public Diplomacy Council or the University of Southern California. So uh, please feel free to uh, send suggestions, suggested speakers, suggested topics, and uh, they'll definitely be welcome. Uh, the next three programs are listed uh, at the bottom of the uh, program for today. Uh, next month we'll be uh, having a program on state and local governments in the United States, how they engage uh, other countries in public diplomacy uh, in September. Uh, because again, the first Monday was a holiday, so we'll be, we'll be meeting on the second Monday, which will be September 11th. So uh, it will be a program on 16 years after 9-11, what are the challenges facing us. Uh, and in October, we have a program with the Embassy of Finland on how they are using public diplomacy to celebrate their centennial, uh, which is this winter. Um, in the back, uh, on the publications table, uh, we have uh, a number of books, including, I know Alan Heil is here, Alan, including a book which Alan edited about international uh, uh, communications and broadcasting. Uh, these are uh, free for you to take, and uh, we are, act we actually have a pretty good supply of most of them, except for the book on Arab and Islamic world. I think we only have five copies left, so if you don't uh, want to have to spend a lot of money on eBay to get them, uh, there are a few left in the back. Um, and uh, let me put up something which is on the back of your program sheets, which is our speaker's biography. And you'll see that she has literally written the book about today's topic, as well as uh, articles, and she was also served as a consultant for the film um, produced by USIA to mark the 50th anniversary of VOA. She also is the only person in the room who can say that her brother and her father were directors of the Voice of America. <laughs> so with that, <laughs> Holly Shulman. Well, thank you all for coming. Uh, th I, did, I assumed it was Adam's idea. He's a good friend of my brother's. Um, uh, John Brown is not here. Anyway, I want to thank him. And then I want to say, well, a couple of things, but this is a talk about the history of the Voice of America. Uh, um, at the time, I thought for about five nanoseconds about continuing into the Cold War, and I cannot tell you how much I did not want to do that. Actually, I could tell you how much I did not want to do that. What I do now is I edit the papers of Dolly Madison, who was born in 1768 and died in 1849. So you can tell I didn't go forward. I went backward. Um, as Adam says, it, it, it's not often that you have something that's so uh, in the family as the voice of America has been in our family. Um, and growing up, uh, Dad certainly talked about the Voice of America, and our library was our propaganda room, and he would tell us that the key to propaganda, and he never used the word public diplomacy, the key to propaganda is first you tell them what you're going to say, then you say it, 
and then you tell them what you said. And if that sounds familiar to you, it's the basic five paragraph essay that every sixth grader is supposed to learn how to write. So <laughs> it is how do you make a point well, clearly and with substance. Um, what I'm going to talk about here is, is propaganda. At that point, radio was new technology. Clearly what it means, uh, and particularly what public diplomacy means, um, has changed with uh, technology. I mean, the technologies that we have around today are unthinkable in the 1940s, and um, I leave it to you who are in this business to decide what do you do about public diplomacy in an era of tweets. This was not a problem in 1941. So I want to begin a little bit by talking about what's, why was World War II, when the Voice of America begins, different from World War I, taking it back even further to the, to the Creel Commission. And the major goal in World War I was, in fact, domestic. It was not overseas. They did have some overseas aid. They used newspaper reporters. They had a small office in Switzerland. It was basically domestic. In World War II, what we did was basically foreign. And by 1944, the Office of War Information itself, which became the umbrella for both domestic and overseas propaganda, by 1944, it was 90% overseas, 10% at home. So these are different notions of what a government should do, different notions of what it meant at the time. And I just want to point out in trying to contextualize that difference is that if you think about 1917, um, obviously the war is raging in Europe in the static sort of way, but what, what um, the American feeling at home in, in terms of that war was a lot of ethnic hatred. It's, uh, if you go back and you read stories about what happened, especially to German Americans, when we went to war uh, against Germany, against the German Empire, as well as the Ottoman Empire and the Austro-Hungarian Empire, uh, it isn't simply that Germans were degraded or fired from jobs or food was no longer called sauerkraut or hamburgers or whatever. Uh, German Jews were lynched. There are just really awful stories in small towns of uh, Germans being dragged behind cars, which is a way to kill somebody. Um, and in the fact, we were not just fighting Germany, although I think a lot of us think of it that this way. We were t fighting not only just Austria, but we were fighting the German Empire and the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And when you think in those terms, we're fighting much of Eastern Europe. So whatever your ethnic feelings are, you're fighting, you're basically fighting Czechs and Hungarians and Romanians and the countries that were once Yugoslavia and are no longer. And all of these places had sent, they, from all of these places, immigrants had come. And in 1917, um, we still did not have a limit on who could come. And the existence of an immigrant community was often very vital. They spoke the language that a newspaper published in their uh, home language. They had their own banks and credit unions. And so being an immigrant from, uh, Bulgaria or Romania or whatever was not the same uh, as you think of, of those ethnic European groups, particularly after 1920, 1922 and 1924. 1922 and so this, there's a lot of ethnic hatred that goes into our feelings about World War I. 
And I really think that's different than World War II. 1922 and 1924, as, I, as most of you know, the United States uh, passed a set of laws in which we cut down our immigration, and it was cut until 1965 when Lyndon Johnson reopened the gates of immigration, pretty much assuming that it would be Irish. Um, we would sort of finish up the Irish immigration because he opened the gates. So by the time you get to 1940, then even though it's not yet a generation, the nature of those communities has changed and the American political and uh, sort of public relation in not everywhere, but in most places, was no longer uh, focused on those immigrant groups. This is a total sideline, but I think it's that fact of being without immigrants after 1924 was very important also to the civil rights movement because American, uh, Americans were n no longer so focused on white groups that they also hated. Uh, that gave more room for African American communities to sort of fill the spaces of how do you make America a better place. In any case, in World War II, therefore, the hatred tended to be really hatred towards our overseas enemies. So that was Germany, that was um, uh, Italy, which had been an ally in World War I, and perhaps in both cases an opportunistic choice by the uh, governments in Italy, and Japan, about which I know nothing in World War II. So there's probably somebody here who knows a lot about what our propaganda to Japan was like. I mean, obviously I know something about the war, but not something about what, uh, and of course they are, they were m ethnically more different, culturally more different, color is different, and we put them in camps here. So, but, but when you, for people like me, I was born in 1943, and I grew up with World War II being the formative experience in my family's relationship to not only the United States, but to the world. And my family came here in the middle of the 19th century. Uh, the war, the Second World War was a war in Western Europe. And in many regards, I think the voice of America was also um, part of this battle against the German forces in, uh, in Western Europe. We weren't really fighting Spain. We had decided not to get involved in that war. We were fighting in France. We were fighting against Germany. We were helping um, Britain. We were uh, worried about Norway, which would, was conquered, and uh, Sweden, which was neutral. All of Scandinavia, incidentally, was neutral during World War I. Um, and that really, what our focus was, it, it's, it seems odd when you think about it, but if you think about all the movies that you go to see today that are about World War uh, II, how many of them, for example, take place in Ukraine? How many of those take place even in Poland? I recently saw a Polish movie to that effect, but very, very, very rarely. We're, and historians are only now beginning even to be able able to get to the records, it was, again, a sideshow. World War II in the East, in Eastern Europe, was even more brutal. It wasn't as systematic, but in many ways, at least as brutal as it was in the West. Nevertheless, by the time we get to World War II, we are in a war which is pretty focused on Germany, with Italy there, and Franco's not a good guy, he's a bad guy, but he's not so important. And, our, and so that's what our focus is. Um, so I think that, as I say, makes for a very different kind of war experience. 
many of the mostly men who populated both the Office of War Information and the Voice of America were American liberals, some of them with sympathy towards the Soviet Union and whatever we now know about the Soviet Union and so on and so forth, as you all know, in the 1930s, there was a great deal of sympathy by non-communist Americans as well as communist Americans. And it, you can argue that it's really the Russians, the Soviet Union, who won World War II. Um, so those are the people who come in. They're not conservatives who come into the Voice of America. And the second group who comes into the Voice of America, which is extremely important, is people who have come to escape specifically the Germans and the Italians as well, mostly the Germans. You know about this great emigration. You all know about Einstein and Niels Bohr and so on and so forth. But the voices coming out of the Voice of America, once it started broadcasting in January uh, 1942 were the voices of men and women who three years before had been living in France, who probably or Italy, or who had been living in Europe, and who probably still had family there, and who had there was a, a sense of immediacy in that propaganda, radio propaganda, that I think is very difficult to sustain unless. It's that those actual people who are often well known in Europe, uh, Andre Breton, who is on the Voice of America. Well, he's a well known Frenchman. So these sorts of people, a man named uh, Pierre Lazareff, who went on to become head of the French desk, he was a very famous um, French newspaper man, editor. After the war, most of these guys go back to to wherever they came from after the war. After the war, Lazarev goes back and he founds a media empire that includes uh, L, which his wife runs, and a number of newspapers and the Time Magazine of France, which I'm, is not coming to me right now. But so he's a, a real media mogul. And he's known. So, you know, this is all for real. Um, and one of the things that people say, say about propaganda is that you need to uh, know something about who you are addressing. That is still true of the Voice of America, but it was true of the Voice of America from the very moment. It's why the Voice of America, and Alan Hiles should answer every question that's post-World War II here because he knows everything. Um, but. But that immediacy is from the very beginning. And it's very important that the desks at the Voice of America are filled by people who haven't just learned the language. They know the language, they know the country, they know the politics, they know the people. And it means that um, they, they, they have an immediacy. Um, the second thing I want to say that, that changed is technology. Radio, between World War I and World War II, radio came into existence. It was invented before World War I, but it wasn't broadcasting radio. Broadcasting radio begins uh, in the period between the wars. The other thing about broadcasting radio is that it is almost exclusively AM, so for any of those, who know the difference between FM and AM. You probably all listen to the radio, if nothing else, in your car, and you listen to FM. But at the time, it was AM, amplitude, modification, modulation, and it, it like goes up and hits the ionosphere and comes back down again. And the short wave, in particular, to me, I think of it as a woman's, a stitching on a woman's hem for her skirt, that it goes like that. And so, um, it can go very long distances. That's the positive thing about uh, AM radio in general, shortwave radio most particularly. The negative thing about it is that its quality is not so good. So there are various things that you immediately cannot do as a broadcaster. You really you forget music. 
forget plays, are the kinds of things that need quality reception you cannot do. Um, one of the things that the Americans therefore tried to do, and this is probably something that you don't know, is to rebroadcast. After all, if, if you can't assure quality radio with FM, why not send it either as a platter or get it re-recorded in London and then send it off to France or Italy or Germany or uh, the Netherlands or wherever you want to. Well, they did do that, but there was one enormous problem. The British edited them. So we, the problem, the trade-off was quality of sound versus what, having control over what you said. And the four, if you read my book, you'll, I go into this, but for the British who did send broadcasters to work with the American broadcasters in New York City, um, they were playing Greeks to the Romans. We were the, we were the Romans so we could build the roads and we could build the ships and we were perfectly uh, capable of doing all of those sort of big engineering feats. But when you needed brains, you needed Greeks. And that was the British. So, um, so the, this is sort of the conditions in which the Voice of America um, begin. And, um, and each desk gets um, created. The scripts are written, the speakers are done, the, everything is desk by desk and language group by language group. Now, just to give you some history here, um, by 1940, Franklin Roosevelt knew that he had to both to boost morale at home, but that he also had to do propaganda abroad. This is something that, again, for Woodrow Wilson, Woodrow Wilson was very concerned with uh, morale at home. He was concerned with subversion at home, and um, he was, um, concerned about his principles abroad, particularly the 14 points. But he wasn't focused the way Franklin Roosevelt was focused on using words to defeat the enemy, it, which is sort of interesting because Wilson's more of a word person, in fact, than, than uh, Roosevelt is. But anyway, by, eight, by 1940, um, they have created something called a coordination co the Committee for the Coordination of Information and the Foreign Information Service. And the person, the earliest uh, person who is involved in that is Donovan, who goes on to found the CIA. And his notion of what propaganda should be is far, if you will, blacker. Uh, that is to say, he was more than delighted not always to tell the truth. And uh, Robert Sherwood became the playwright and the speechwriter for FDR, became head of the Foreign Information Service, and then um, the, not the Voice of America itself, but the overseas branch. And he always understood that it, if it wasn't the truth, it wasn't going to work. And so there were these two sort of branches. The two men couldn't stand each other. There was no way in which FDR could do his usual number, which is lock them in a closet until they come out with a good compromise, and then he would talk to them again. Um, they just, it just wasn't possible. So it, again, Donovan goes on to spy the spy world, and they create the Office of War Information, the Office of War Information is a foreign newspaper person, Elmer Davis. And in fact, besides all of these Europeans who come in, many, many of the people who are at the uh, overseas branch and the domestic branch of the Office of War Information are newspaper people. So it's, it, that itself explains something about what the propaganda was like, or the message was like, or the content was like during World War II. These are people whose profession is conveying the truth 
And we can argue about that and say we're post-modernists, but they certainly wouldn't have uh, understood it in that way. The person who was chosen, however, to head the Voice of America was neither of those things. The person who was chosen to head uh, the Voice of America was um, um, uh, ah, I'm blocking here, and I'm sure I have his name. Um, Houseman, John Houseman. John Houseman was a producer, a radio producer, a theater producer, um, and particularly known for War of the Worlds. And War of the Worlds, of course, is a perfect example of using, masking drama in truth in a form of truth, not in truth, but in a form of truth. So the whole first part of War of the Worlds are news bulletins. And that's what made people take it seriously. That's why it was so scary. But his idea of what was going to be a broadcast um, was really formed by his dramatic background. So I hate to tell you this, but at the very beginning of The Voice of America, it was not only that people told the truth. Uh, that always held, but the dramatic forms in which they were contained, if you think about here is the newsroom and the, uh, the, here's all this truth that they're collecting and then they pour it into the container for the script writers and what the script writers do is they put it into whatever form they want at that moment and the script writers are much more likely to uh, make it dramatic. There are four, the Voice of America initially has a cycle of 15 minutes, um, four languages, each has 15 minutes, then it starts all over again. So that's how it works. In that uh, 15 minutes, they are going to, whatever language desk it is, they're going to adopt. Again, again we have policy that sort of, if you think of a toothpaste tube that has been mostly used up and so you're sort of squeezing all of this stuff until it comes out at the other end. Um, th the script writers and the policy makers are supposed to be following State Department, uh, presidential, and military policy. In fact, in the very early days of the war, their feeling was they probably, they were surrounded by people who had escaped these countries. Uh, Max Askely, for example, knew more than uh, the State Department might about being in Italy and what Mussolini was like. So they felt that what they could do is sort of from the outsides of foreign policy, they could press on the edges and try to influence po foreign policy. And the way they also felt they were best able to do that for ordinary people, they're not writing at this point for the elite. They're writing one-step propaganda uh, if it's from my mouth to your ear. And um, so they, um, they make it as dramatic as possible to hold their attention. And so if you look at the early Voice of America broadcasts, it's four voices, and they're in short sentences, and I ha I have a little quote here, which is, uh, one broadcast described the uh, severity of Nazi rule and the consequences of the German plan to conscript French workers. This is, my book is only about propaganda to France. I took a case study. There are these voices, these different voices. So it says, such is the law in Nazi Germany. Next voice, all that is forbidden is required. Next voice, such is the voice Hitler wants to impose on the world. Next voice, all that is forbidden is required. Next voice, such is the law of the Vichy Commandantur wants to impose on the French. Next voice, free expression. Next voice, forbidden. To be a patriot, forbidden. To eat enough, forbidden. Now, that doesn't sound like what you think of the voice of America. And it's, it's, not, it's not a lie. It's just attempting to do, to grab people's hearts and emotions and in some ways to pull them into the resistance. 
I don't know how many of you have ever heard in World War II there was something called a V campaign. It's the V campaign. And it, and it uh, basically asked people in the resistance to on walls and the sides of trucks and wherever they were to just do this, a V. Because V stood for victory and um, it was a symbol, therefore, of resistance. However, if you were caught putting, painting a V someplace, you were also sent to prison and probably killed. And it was asking the resistance to, um, it, to take quasi-military action. And by the time it's 1943, they, we, don't, we tell them not to do it. They should not take their lives in their hands. But at the very beginning of the war, this was also something that, that we were excited about. The British did it too. Um, so what I, I sang about the Voice of America in its earliest days, it's led not by a journalist, but by an actor. Um, and it's also led by a group of New Deal liberals who were, they may not have uh, been members of the Communist Party, but they certainly would have been tinged with a certain fellow travelerism. That is to say, what Russia, they hadn't been to Russia. They didn't know what Russia was like. They knew what Russian propaganda was telling us what it was like. And um, so they had a very left-wing view when the United States recognizes uh, Admiral Darlin and decides to work with Admiral Darlin in France in 1942-43, they're furious. How can you, now, for the State Department, for the military, this is expedience. This is how you win a war. For the people at the Voice of America, this is how you lose a war. Because what you're doing is you're working with the uh, ideological enemy. And we could go on and on and on in that sort of thing. What it ends up doing is uh, creating, in a series of events that I'm not going to recount here, the o OWI is overhauled. And most of these people are told to leave because they, the federal government, that's not what they want. And in fact, the person who becomes head of the overseas branch of the Office of War Information at that point was my father. So um, what you see, if you look at the Voice of America broadcasts, and if you went in and looked at OWI po uh, posters, because they did have posters, or leaflets, because they did drop leaflets. So what could they get? I mean, there's always a question, what can you get behind enemy lines? There, there's a limited amount that, it's a limited technologies that you could get behind enemy lines, which is why radio was so attractive. But in all of these different media, you see a really profound change from what the Voice of America did in 1942 under Houseman and what it was doing in 1944. And in that sense, it changed from a kind of voice and uh, format of agitprop, does that word convey? to news. And, uh, and one of the things that helped them decide that is that the British, who thought of themselves as Greeks, sent their warriors over to the Voice of America and said, the V campaign is not going to do anything. People aren't going to risk their lives um, if you're just this, what I just read you, you know, these, these scripts that are there to uh, infuse you with enthusiasm to fight the axis, they need information. They're turning on their radios because they want information. And so what happens is that by 1944, the Voice of America becomes a radio broadcasting channel which really hones in on news and what you need to know and tell it straight. And that, in some ways, it seems to me, the creation 
we talk about creation in institutional terms. So there's a certain amount of discussion what day in February was the first broadcast of The Voice of America. Again, Alan can probably tell you more about that than I can. But I think the creation of The Voice of America, it, it doesn't start on a certain day in that sense. The, the creation of what The Voice of America is today and why The Voice of America is an important, great institution is what happens during World War II, that the uh, Office of War Information, the leaders of um, propaganda, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, they, they formulate how they want to reach the enemy. And they formulate how they want to reach those who are resisting or they hope will resist in occupied territory. And that takes not a day, it takes weeks and months and really years. And what they come out with is a much more uh, news-like. You could see this in propaganda. If you, can, if you think in your mind, for example, even of World War I propaganda, which is not only Uncle Sam wants you, but German propaganda with monsters and their dripping green blood, and it's, I don't know whether you can imagine that sort of thing. If you look at Office of War Information posters in, um, at the, by the second half of the um, Second World War, they're mostly photographs or statements, but mostly photographs. Why? Because a photograph, you know, you and I can sit here and say to what extent is a photograph necessarily a medium of truth. Um, how much, you know, do you drag bodies around the, feet, the military field to make it look more gruesome? Do you do this, that, or the other? What do you crop? Now you have more technology to do all kinds of things. But basically, a, a, a photograph is a statement of truth. And so the posters become a statement, uh, become very uh, photograph-oriented um, and a statement of truth. And the Voice of America becomes a news medium run by people who are journalists or who appreciate journalism. And so I think that's really, in some ways, my, my biggest message here. There is one. Going along with this change is not only the disservice that this kind of agitprop can serve, but also what's happening in the war. And what's happening in the war means that in, 19, in February 1942, there is no good news. So it, in fairness to the propagandists, it's very difficult for them to um, broadcast a series of news programs in which they persuade people that the Allies are going to win by all the good news. Well, by 1944, there's a lot of good news, at, particularly after Stalingrad. There's a lot of good news. So the, what ha the war isn't over, but the fighting isn't over, but we know who's going to win. And that means that this much more news-like approach has fodder, it has something to work with. And, and at that point, in fact, the news of the, the war becomes its own best salesman, if you will. Um, so when the war ends, there is a question about whether the Voice of America is useful any longer. And there are certainly a lot of people who say it isn't useful. It is saved. Um, it does continue. And then, as you know, you have these other kinds of propaganda, such as Radio Free Europe, which did not exist in World War II. Radio Free Europe was intended to be black propaganda. And the Voice of America always was intended to be white propaganda. Um, and. A and for all of you sitting here, this is the legacy. It isn't really, I mean, I was thinking about this. I, this is a public diplomacy forum. I don't think the Voice of America in World War II was public diplomacy, it was propaganda. But the propaganda that it developed, the style of propaganda that it developed, 
the kind of medium for it moves into public diplomacy in a way that the initial uh, forms of propaganda, the, the playlets, the John Houseman, War of the Words, Worlds kind of thing, would have had, a, if it had stayed like that, I think it would have been very hard to convert that into public diplomacy, but it didn't. And so what the Voice of America was by 44 and 45 could easily be converted into our peacetime uh, use. That's it. I've talked much too long. Thank you very much. Uh, questions, comments? Uh, Arnold Zeitlin. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, did VOA play a role in making the Soviet Union an acceptable ally during World War II, the, during the Uncle Joe period of the relationship? That would have been domestic propaganda. And uh, to tell you the honest truth, I didn't study it. Um, it quickly diminished. There was less and less of it. Um, it, in terms of overseas propaganda, was Stalin portrayed as our partner? Not really. Even though there were, they were Stalin sympathizers, the line was really drawn on people like Darlin or uh, King Victor Emmanuel in Italy. Can we accept those kinds of people as our allies? It wasn't uh, the Soviet Union, even though I think every, you know, they must have appreciated the Soviet Union. As I say, the Soviet Union in large measure won the war, and, um, and they didn't know what was going on in Russia. That, a lot of that we didn't know until after 1989. Sherry, you have the next question. Sherry Mueller, AU School of International Service. Um, do you have some favorite stories that your dad told that are relevant to today? My father's a wonderful storyteller, but not about the Voice of America. <laughs> <laughs> Our childhood stories were wool dog and bulldog. Um, but so I'm going to tell you a story that uh, I partially end the book with. I'll tell you two stories, but one that I, I, I partially end the book with, and that is I, I went to interview a man named Robert Newman who had been writing scripts for the English desk. There was an overseas English desk, so he had been writing for the English desk, and I went to interview him. One of the pleasures of writing in the 1980s was that there were enough people still alive so that I could still talk to people and I didn't need to buy a Ouija board. So I asked him about D-Day because there were no scripts that had been left. They did this random job of keeping, the National Archives did, random job, two days a month. And I think the two days a month were randomly <laughs> chosen. And somehow when they you know, picked them out, um, D-Day didn't get there. <laughs> so I. Um, and, the, and it was even harder to find anything that w was actually recorded. So I went to interview him and I asked him, uh, you know, if he had stories and he, he told me stories that, that he remembers walking the streets of New York and picking out people randomly on the streets and interviewing them and I said, do you have any of these left? And he said, no. And I said, it's, it's unfortunate because I can't find any, so I can't use them. I could use his interview, but I couldn't use the stories, to which he said to me, well, why don't you make it up? <laughs> That's just one of my most favorite <laughs> stories. <laughs> this is a man who went on to write children's novels. Anyway, um, I'm going to tell you a story of one person who worked for the French desk of the Voice of America. Um, his name, as I knew him, was Michel Gordet. 
His original name was Michel Rapaport. You could see why he changed his name. Um, his first wife was Chagall's daughter. I should say, making this person even more sort of totally European in my mind, his parents were born in Russia, and they fled uh, after the, uh, maybe before the revolution, must have been before the revolution, they fled to France, and he was born on the train. So if you asked him where he came from, he said, I don't know, wherever the train was at that moment. <laughs> Um, so he grew up in France. He married Chagall's daughter, and um, he worked for Pierre Lazarev. He was a he was a, a um, originally a lawyer who moved into journalism. Trained as a lawyer, moved into journalism, and a local gendarme knocked on his door and um, said to him. Um, it, it will make sense if you don't stay here. So they didn't. They went to Vichy. And when they were in Vichy, someone else came and warned them, if you stay here, you will be picked up. And um, so they left. And they went to Spain. And they were stopped at the border of Spain. and. For those of you who know something about Franco and World War II, he was a bit, he's a bit odd character. I mean, he is clearly a fascist. Uh, if you're a liberal, you can't stand anything about him. But he was not bad to the Jews. Um, and and many, many Jews who could prove that they were Sephardic, they, their families came from Turkey, could in fact go to the Levant, to the Middle East, through Spain. So they get to the border. And he's told he can make one phone call. And he calls his father-in-law. So Chagall makes, you know, is at the other end of this phone and vouches for him. And because he's Chagall, he's not prime minister, he's not minister of art, he's, he's Chagall. But because he's Chagall, they let them through. Sort of, again, what it's a, it's a, it's a different world. I don't, I don't know what the equivalent would be today or who would be famous enough today, whether it would take uh, a pop singer or you know, whatever. I, it, I don't think it would be Jasper Johns I, you know, or some more modern person that would. Uh, but, but, the, but the guard I in Spain and whoever the guard probably called his commander knew who Chagall was and they let them through. Hi, thank you again for your talk. These are wonderful stories. Jim Bullock, Public Diplomacy Council. Um, could you talk a little bit about the partisan politics? You mentioned that the people that initially staffed the voice were, were uh, New Dealers, Roosevelt people. Um, but talk about the other side, I know there were uh, significant isolationists uh, associated with the Republican Party. The, the major defunding of OWI that happens halfway through the war is at their behest. OWI gets dismantled with indecent haste. VOA survives. Can you talk a little bit about the, the partisan politics behind how VOA survives and OWI doesn't? Well, I could if I knew more. But I, first of all, I would suggest reading a book by a man named Alan Winkler, W-I-N-K-L-E-R, who wrote a book on the Office of War Information and its disputes and relationships with the federal government. He'd written that, and it really didn't interest me very much, so I wrote what I wrote. But if that's what you want to look at, he wrote an excellent book. Um, the kinds of Republicans that you're talking about, of course, didn't flock to the Voice of America. Um, why did it continue? Well, one of the important things is that it was not to be broadcast in the United States. So if you can't hear it in the United States, and again, I think uh, Alan could probably talk a lot about that too, but if you couldn't hear it in the United States, and that was part of the conditions of existence, and you couldn't hear it during World War Too either. I mean, you you just couldn't hear the Voice of America in the United States. 
So I think that really helped. I think, you know, I don't know. It, they had tried using the uh, networks before World War II. Um, during the 1930s up to about 1940, as it became clear that other nations were using radio um, and radio reception was becoming something that was a medium successful enough to be used. Um, the State Department's broadcaster of first choice was NBC. NBC was, of course, NBC and ABC, and CBS was the, you know, followed along in the tracks. There were some other shortwave broadcasters that they tried to work with, but they didn't have the substance to be able to do anything. But what they found with uh, commercial broadcasters is that they just couldn't do it. There's some of it, I think, here in my um, book. I wrote a dissertation, which is not this book, about the period from 1919 to 1939, 1940. And in there, you can find fairly lengthy descriptions of what they could get out of the broadcasters and what they could get out of the broadcasters. And the broadcasters didn't want to do it, and what they turned out was junk. So if there was going to be anything, it was going to have to be the voice of America or something they had to create all over again. So. Or, Alan, do you know specifically what was the reason that they decided that we had to continue the VOA, whereas other things we didn't? All I know is that apparently Truman had an outsized influence on the final decision. And also Benton. Mm -hmm. Both of them together. And Bantley, of course, wonderful story about him in London because during the war the Voice of America label was not really used all that much in the broadcast, particularly in the last several years. And, and there but, was something I forgot about, which but, is the American Broadcasting Station in Europe. There was, that was also in London. Right, but. and so there was a program schedule in one of the London papers and Benton happened to be there, and the program schedule said, Voice of America. And he said, is that a local outfit here in London broadcasting uh, to now most of Europe? And then looked into it and discovered that it w w there was a Voice of America, a real one, in Washington. And from that day on, Benton insisted that the VOA label be attached to then Assistant Secretary of State right. for uh, right. public affairs, that the VOA label be attached to every broadcast mm -hmm. because he said that's really the logo we should be using. Mm -hmm. Now the big question today is, is a voice of America accurate in this day and age? Maybe there ought to be something else like some gobbledygook like the multimedia voice of America or something like that because it's no longer contrary to the charter that is law. It is no longer a voice of America by radio only. Mm -hmm. It has all of these other media that are racing ahead now. Although radio has held its place as the second largest audience after TV today and uh, still behind a bit are the new media, but they're coming up and coming up. They increased last year by something like 45 percent. That is those people who were accessing all of the U.S. international broadcasters via uh, multimedia. Well, my only reaction to that is A, voice does not have to be heard. It can be read. You often talk about a author's voice. And so it could perfectly well be used metaphorically as well as actually. And there's something to continuity. That, but that old. I'm old. I would add, too, not only something to continuity, but something to a brand name yeah. that is so yeah. well established. Yeah. For example, all of U.S. international broadcasting today 
commands a following of uh, something like 287 million viewers, internet users, radio listeners every week. But of those 287, 236.8 million are VOA listeners. So I, you know, my, my reaction to that is it's, when you talk about Benton and Truman and whatever, so partly as opposed to the isolationists that are still in Congress, partly it is, as is true always with history, partly it's just the, the coincidences of who is where doing what. Um, it, did this general win the war, or if he had been killed, would the next general have won the war because of all of the other factors that were there? So, I have a question. The, uh, you say in your excellent prologue, everybody read her prologue. It <laughs> is just you. supremely fine. You say, what would the Voice of America been like if Roosevelt had chosen Edward R. Murrow? to be the head of the Voice of America at the beginning, rather than actor John Houseman. What's your answer to that? Uh, I think it would have been less agitprop, and there would have been more immediate emphasis on conveying not just emotions, but conveying a sense of the sort of totality of the war and what's going on. In a word, I think it would have been better. But Murrow was no, also not a journalist. I mean, I know I chose that name, but he was, not a, he was not trained as a journalist. He was trained as a dramatist in college. And if you go and you read what he wrote from London, from the streets of London during World War II, and it's, if you like good literature, it's worth reading. The way in which he describes walking down the street, there is a chair, a, a building has been bombed, a chair was thrown into the sidewalk. I, I can't do it, but it's, tr it's not only beautiful prose, but it has what literary critics call, um, it, it has the convincingness of the specifics that a generality doesn't, which is what Hausman was using, a generality is not as convincing as a specific. And so, you, you know, read your favorite novelists. Probably most of them use fictional specifics as if they were, of course, non-fictional specifics, because it brings you in and you understand it. And I think that that was really what was on my mind, Alan, that it would have been a, it would have been, um, it would have had a different notion of what makes drama, a different notion of what conveys atmosphere, and, a, and I think a greater commitment to, uh, to the, to the truth as it was happening on that street at that moment. But of course, you never know. I mean, you know, what would have happened if Hitler hadn't been born? Yeah. I mean, that's why I say all of these things. What would have happened if? And do you believe in, in, in sort of immediate causes, or do you believe in these long underlying causes? Or what most historians believe is it's both. Big events require many causes. Uh, Professor Shulman, uh, like your brother and your father, I was privileged to be the director of the Voice of America for a while. I finished up uh, in 2015 after four years. Um, and I'm a friend of your brother's and an admirer. Uh, so it's nice to see that the family is pretty classy all around. <laughs> um, uh, my question is this. Uh, since we're talking about the history of Voice of America, it's foundational period, and you talk about this transition from uh, kind of the, the John Hausman VOA to the 1944, just the facts, ma'am, more flavor. Um, I, you know, 
used to use, and I think every VOA director before me did, um, the, the old quote, the news may be bad, the news may be good, we shall tell you the truth, mm -hmm. allegedly said, I think truth in truth said at some point in the early broadcast, no doubt in German, um, by one of the announcers in 1942. Um, how are we to understand what was happening there? Was that um, kind of we, we want you to feel that everything we say is true, although actually we're doing little dramatic presentations in four languages? I don't or, or, I mean, you know, in, in words, what, what I, think, I think that became kind of almost the foundational language right. around which certainly the VOA I led right. was very much um, oriented. How did that come about, given what you said about the, the shift from well, the Hausman dra dramatist flavored uh, to, VOA at the beginning? To information. That information was the best propaganda. Yeah, but, uh, but, but when, you sa when somebody but in 1942 says those words, what do they, they mean by that? They didn't say information, they said truth. And I don't think the Voice of America lied. Oops, I shouldn't do that because I have a. Um, that I, I'm not even beginning to suggest that the Voice of America broadcasts in 19, late 1942 that Hitler has been assassinated and you know whatever dream you might want. I, they didn't do that. They told the truth. What they didn't do is package it as information. And I think that's the arc that I'm trying to explain. And that they understood that you could say more and be more effective if you, if you will, if your dramatic format is journalistic and informational. Now, journalists, it, the form, that form doesn't mean you tell the truth either. I mean, what means that you sell, tell the truth? He was talking about photographs. Matthew Brady moved the bodies on the Civil War battlefield. So nothing, nothing can ensure that you do except your supervisor and, you know, it's the institution of the Voice of America that has to make it sure that it's the truth. The listener, on the other end, either believes or doesn't believe, but it isn't that kind of truth that I think changed. I think it is a notion of how you best reach out and, and, and grab the listener and say, come to me. Um, now, I, I, if I could be, th does that answer your question? There is something else that I, I, I write about in this book and I um, talk about it in other places, but anyway, literary theorists whom you may loathe for their uh, postmodernism, and I can't say that I l love postmodernism, but they do say there's a reader in the text and, um, and, and the diff there is a difference between the reader in the text and the actual reader. And in this, I think you, I don't know if it's a question of right or wrong, but I think you can see something. If you go back and you read the Voice of America broadcasts, you can tell something about who they thought they were talking to. Now, who were they talking to? They could not possibly go and do a poll inside of Germany or Vichy France or later all of France. They, the only people they could poll were people who escaped and went to England, and those people they could interview. But that is not, uh, that doesn't meet polling standards. So there wasn't any way for them to say, a broadcaster today or you know, whatever, even more, you, the clicks that you make on your computer will send whatever advertisements to you. There was nothing of comparable value that they had. So here we have in, in the, on the French desk these people like Lazareff or Breton or whoever, and it isn't only a question of um, truth and format and information. It's also who did they think they were broadcasting for? And there is a, a magic, kind of a magical layer in here, which I can't possibly, I couldn't retrieve it myself and I can't retrieve it to you, which is what did it sound like? And 
well, I do know that when, let's say, Breton was, Breton was one of the uh, most favorite broadcasters. He had a mellifluous voice. But he was in a, sort of a glass room, and then he was being, uh, he, he was, his voice was an instrument, and there was a conductor. So the, the emotions that um, you want dramatically were, but it was still his voice, and he still thought certain kinds of things. So whatever it was, it was a combination of all of those things. And then you not seeing him. You, the listener, are only hearing him. So we get to the Nixon-Kennedy debates. What does somebody sound like versus what does somebody look like? These are all, you know, these m almost magical ingredients in, in, in these various media that I think are, f I think they're really, really, really important, but I am a historian. At no point do I think that American broadcasting overseas, that the voice of America should ever lie. But still, you have one voice versus another, and that may be a woman's voice versus a man's voice. How many women would they have had broadcasting in World War II? I suspect not very many, because a, a woman's voice, 1943, 1944, it's not a military voice. It's not a voice of victory. It's a woman's voice. So they would have moments in which they did scripts for women. And that could have a woman's voice, because it talked about what can you cook, what you, can you collect, what can you, you know, that sort of thing. So it was the domestic side of overseas propaganda. It's still true. It's not as true as it was then. It is still true. So I th I'm not sure, I mean, I think that the label that you're committed, that you're talking about and um, that you're committed to is, is the base. It's Everything gets built up from there, but the sort of way in which it gets built up is has shades and complications, and that doesn't make it not the truth. It just makes it what it is. Can I pick up on something you just said on, on uh, what it is today? Uh, looking back at World War II and the propaganda um, environment, and today we have a if anything, a more complex propaganda environment with uh, RT, with uh, Sputnik Radio, which is now over the air on FM here in Washington, D.C. Uh, we have um, uh, CCTV, China. Uh, we have all these different, <coughs> uh, to one extent or another, uh, journalistic and propaganda uh, entities. How do you think in today's environment, um, uh, VOA and others could learn some lessons from World War II? Uh, that's much more fun to go back to the 18th and 19th century than to live in the present. Um, <laughs> you know, I think that something like the Voice of America should be part of a, a civil service, which it is. Uh, yes, the Vo Voice of America director is appointed and so on and so forth. But any institution, if it's going to work well, needs people who are really good and really have institutional memory and know problems as well as successes. That's part of it. I, I think we live in a really, 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 really difficult time. Uh, RT, certainly, we get it in Charlottesville. And so if you're watching it in Charlottesville, it's a cable show. It's part of um, MHZ, if any of you watch MHZ. But we get you know, Deutsche Welle, and we get Radio France, and so on and so forth, or Television France, or whatever. So I guess the thing to me that's most important is how do you educate people so that they can discriminate what they hear, and that is, I mean, I, I, that may be, I don't want to say it's a lost cause, but it's a long uphill battle. And I think the other thing is that news today has been so demonized and um, 
I mean, I've never tweeted in my life, and I don't follow anybody. I do look at Facebook, but I, I, I so this is something I feel I'm old enough I can excuse myself from. But I, I don't know how can uh, how does the Voice of America, um, and if you disagree with me, please tell me. But how does the Voice of America? maintain a line about what the government thinks when we have a president who changes his mind and changes his mind so publicly on a tweet. And then where does that leave the statement that you've carefully crafted to present it in the best possible way to Urdu speakers? I, I, ugh, you've got a problem. <laughs> and, but on the other hand, I can say that it's probably more important than it was in World War II. just talking to a, a, a person in the Russian service at VOA, and I asked a similar question. And she said, well, I know a lot of people in Russia, and I talked to them. And the most frequent uh, thing that they say back to me, the most frequent thing they say back to me about this whole, how do you cover Trump and him calling the New York <laughs> Times fake news and so forth, how do you cover that? Um, she said, is, uh, they say, why are you all being so mean to your president? And she said, and that gives us the perfect VOA opportunity to give a civics lesson. What is this country about? It's not about one man running everything and being right no matter what, even when he changes his mind every five minutes. It's not about that. And if this particular president doesn't understand that, he will. <laughs> I like that. Well, on that note, uh, please join me in thanking our speaker. And thank all of you. And thank you, Adam and Mr. Brown. Our thanks also to our host, the American Foreign Service Association. Oh, Amanda Bennett has just joined us, the current head of voice of her. Oh, you were in the back? <laughs> okay, uh, Monday, August 7, uh, state and local governments and how they are engaging in public diplomacy. Thank you. Uh, until then, we're adjourned.